about three years ago, we, our foundation had been working in digital learning, but three years ago we started re-asking ourselves a question, why is it that some youth thrive while others fall behind? Um, this was obviously not an easy question to answer, but we took this question out to about 100 experts in the field, everything from everyone from neuroscience to educators to uh, health specialists. And um, you know, what we saw was that while demands for life success were evolving, um, our education system wasn't. And um, we kept coming back to this notion of social and emotional learning from all the experts that we talked to as really helping give young people a leg up. Skills like empathy, grit, resilience. Um, we're helping young people navigate their lives and, and really understand their paths forward. Um, when we started digging in a little bit deeper to this idea of social and emotional learning, we also saw that the evidence is in. So these skills are linked, strongly linked to um, life success indicators. Things like academics, uh, employability skills, um, happy, healthy relationships. So the science was backing these uh, skills as important in helping young people thrive. Um, we also saw that four in 10 youth uh, nationally aren't doing well, and two in five aren't getting the supports they need um, to succeed. So we felt like as a foundation, we can help impact that. So we started a program in social and emotional learning. Um, when we did a little bit uh, of a deeper dive, we, the way our foundation works is we really try to identify the gaps and the white spaces in the field that we're working in. So what we saw was that there was a lot of work going on with younger kids, um, and we saw a lot of programs bubbling up in schools. Uh, where we saw gaps in white spaces was really at the teenage level, um, and, and what we wanted to focus on as a foundation was more on practices than programs. We don't believe this is a one-size-fits-all type approach. Um, and another thing we wanted to note was that it's not just young people that can benefit from this. Uh, all people of all ages, we all know adults also that lack these kind of social and emotional skills. Um, so we wanted to understand really how to help young people develop it, but also help adults cultivate these skills so that they're better prepared to help young people. Um, so we looked to the out of school space as really um, a, a, an area where these types of transformational experiences can occur for young people. Um, and we also saw that a lot of after-school practitioners were doing this type of work with young people. They might not have been calling it social and emotional learning, um, but they were getting the type of outcomes that we want to see with our, with our young people today. Um, so we saw that there were exemplars in this space that were doing this work, and we wanted to understand from them how they're doing this. Um, what are the practices they're doing? What are the key youth experiences that these young people are going through in their programs that are helping them develop these skills? So, Really, uh, we wanted to dissect these skills and then uh, figure out a way to help share them with the field and to help other practitioners and educators um, really develop the skills that they need to help young people develop these skills. So what we did was we built a learning community, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, to really identify these standards, or what we're calling these promising practices in the guidebook you'll see are called standards for STL practices. And then how we, we kind of take them uh, and put them into practice um, is called the SCL Strengths Builder, which Gina will talk about soon. So we put out an invitation for uh, LOIs to, the, to national, nationally um, and received about 250 applications. Um, from that, we uh, really selected eight organizations across the U.S. So you'll see a sampling of, their, of who they are. Um, every, everyone from California to obviously here in Minnesota, um, Wisconsin, Philadelphia, New York, they span the country and they also span uh, different types of content. We have a boat building organization in Philadelphia. Um, we have a theater based organization, Paul's here to join us today from Possibility Project in New York. Um, we have uh, Wyman Center, which really focuses on community service. So we have all types of organizations, but what they were able to do was identify what were the practices that they're doing that really link to these social and emotional gains in young people. Um, so we brought them together, and then we also brought on the Weichart Center, and Gina's here today from the Weichart Center to uh, talk about her role. Um, and, and additionally, we, we brought on Reed Larson, who is uh, a uh, researcher out of the University of Illinois and who has been looking at the youth development space for some decades now. So we brought them together um, in this learning community over the course of 16 months. We convened the group three different times over the course of those years. Um, and then also the Weichart Center did a program evaluation where they measured uh, its youth growth at three different time points throughout a program year. 
what I think was unique also was that what we wanted to do was really elevate the uh, practitioners as the experts in this field. Uh, we wanted to learn from them what they were doing and just really help name these skills and help name these practices so that others can be more intentional about the type of work they're doing with young people. So the cohorts from each of these eight programs consisted of a uh, director or a program leader, a uh, youth development expert that's working uh, directly with young people, and then a researcher or evaluator if that was, um, if, if the organization had that member. And um, we brought them together to study these six domains. These were selected um, mainly in part by our, by our eight participants that joined this, this project, as well as um, from the, the research base and work of Reed Larson. So what, what we found, Gino's gonna talk about the findings, but what we, what we have, what we've uh, produced out of this learning community is the field guide, which you'll find on your tables, um, that really highlights the set of practices and experiences that kids uh, have in each of these six domains, as well as the kind of organizational structures that need to be in place for social and emotional learning to thrive in your organization. Um, there are also case narratives from each of the eight organizations to do a deeper dive into understanding how those organizations operate and how they help young people develop these skills. There's a technical report which will be released next month, which will, is an even deeper dive into the uh, measures and methodology and findings from the study. And then um, I want to also direct you to this um, website that we've built as a companion piece called selpractices.org. Uh, we really created that to be um, a virtual learning community. So we want everyone's voices to be heard and we want to share out best practices on that site. So if you go there, you'll find um, excerpts from the guide, uh, you know, kind of easier to uh, use pieces and resources, um, examples of staff practices and activities uh, that, that these programs and others have been using to help young people develop social and emotional skills. Um, and, and we want you to, to share, um, you know, what you see in your organization, what's working, what's not, this field guide is really a first stab at, at helping the field become more intentional about the way that they're practicing these skills. Uh, and, and it's gonna be many iterations of it. So we wanna hear from you what's working and what's not and what your program does.